Now today in the year 2008, you're not going to find too many open mines throughout the area. Um, however, underground, where they would have had different levels down in the mines, um, sometimes several hundred feet down, different gangway levels, a lot of that structure is still there. It's up at the surface where a lot of the freezing and thawing has uh, weathered down on the, uh, what were the, the timbers, what was the, the cribbing, the wooden cribbing, and a lot of that's rotted away over a hundred years. So what you have is underground, it might still be intact, all the, the chutes and the gangways, but on the surface, as you can see in this model, once the wood is rotted away, the land collapses and subsides around the hole. Please don't even consider going in one of these holes if you ever find one. They were built over a hundred years ago. Any timbers that were put in place to hold up the roof have long since rotted away. With the increase in production, one of the things that allowed the iron industry to really survive and really thrive was the immigrants who were coming to America from primarily North and Western Europe. In this region, we saw a lot of Irish, English, and German, but here in Danville, Pennsylvania, we primarily saw the Welsh. So as most of the immigrants came here and they settled in working in the mines and the furnaces and on the railroads, it was really very, very difficult work. Most of them would spend probably a 10 to 12 hour day deep in the mines or at the furnaces working for very, very minimum wage. The buggy that you saw a little bit earlier, that was filled with about a ton of iron ore. That would be worth about one dollar. Multiply that by six days worth of work, you're making six dollars a week. Not only that, but then they had to live in basically housing that was provided by the company, usually located on the outskirts of town. Unfortunately, the, the housing wasn't provided to them. It was actually, they had to rent it. So they would be paying, you know, very, very, um, you know, high rent for meager housing while the owners of the mine, they're living in lavish luxury in a section of town like you see behind me, represented by the mansion. Now an additional industry that went with making iron, both in the furnaces and also at the puddling mills, is the quarrying or mining of limestone. The scene here is a picture of 2008 in uh, the Winfield Quarry, just outside of Lewisburg. Currently the Winfield Quarry is in idle, but there's still plenty of limestone there and you might see it reopen any year now. Uh, but it's that limestone that was used in the flux at the furnaces and also in the puddling mills to get the wrought iron balls to just the right consistency. Hello, I'm a puddler. Now, Danville was unique. Not only did we have the blast furnace to make the pig iron, but from there we took it into a, what they called a puddle mill. And that's where you turn pig iron into wrought iron. Now there was two puddle furnaces, a single furnace and a double furnace. The single furnace was one puddler and a helper, and that took a charge of 600 pounds of pig iron. The double furnace took two puddlers and two helpers. You had a firing side and a drawing side. So in each furnace you would apply, in the double furnace you would have put in 600 pounds. Pigs like this. And it would go. Now, you would get that cooking just like soup. It would melt. And once that got cooking just like soup, you would add more iron ore and limestone. And that would change the nature of that. It would get thick and pasty. Now the puddlers had three basic tools. A riddle, a splasher, and a paddle. And you would work that into crude iron balls. And it was hot, very hot. And once you would get that uh, into crude iron balls with your paddle, now is when you got the roasting. And once the door was opened up, you had a set of big tongs on an overhead trolley that ran the length of the mill down to the first set of rolls, which was called the squeezer, because it squeezed more uh, slag out of the iron. It would be a great rain of sparks and the noise. Here in Danville, Danville was famous for the first iron tea rail in the United States. On October 8, 1845, in the number one rolling mill of the Montour Ironworks, the first iron tea rail was rolled. This is Danville's claim to fame.
So in our video today, we've explored the three different facets of the iron ore industry. We started with looking at where the iron ore itself comes from, out of the mines in a region that stretches from Berwick, Pennsylvania, all the way to Bedford, Pennsylvania. We looked at the blast furnaces, where they would actually bring the iron ore, they would pour it into these blast furnaces with an abundance of natural fuels, and from there they would smelt pig iron. The pig iron then was taken, and we just explored a little bit about how the puddling process worked, where they would take that raw pig iron and make it into a product that could then be used uh, for a variety of circumstances, whether it's making a simple little hinge, or whether it's helping to make a rail car or an iron T rail like we saw that Danville was the first to do. So you have to understand the importance that Central Pennsylvania and this whole industrial aspect of it has played in the greater scheme of things for the history of the United States. I mean think about all the different things that iron is used for. Um, it really came into being very very crucial when we got involved in both World War I and World War II. There were local manufacturers here who actually helped to make tanks and pontoon boats and all kinds of other things that contributed to the war effort. In a way, even though we're 50 years, 60 years removed from World War II, this area is still very, very important to the industrialization of the United States. I mean, think about all the immigrants that came here and they settled here and they've, they've populated these valleys. You think about the amount of resources that are used here that brought in tremendous, tremendous amounts of capital. That capital that could then be used not only for the mines and the industries that were back then, but as technology and, and new things came along that caused this stuff to change, all those different things, the hard work ethic, the money, and everything like that is actually rolled into newer industries, whether it's pharmaceuticals uh, and, and different industries that are found in this area. Interestingly enough, there are still iron foundries here in this area, from Milton to Berwick and places beyond those regions. So here in central Pennsylvania, We've got a beautiful countryside, but what's really great to know is that under the earth, all the mineral resources that nature has provided us has allowed us to create this wonderful, wonderful communities that we live in today with an incredibly rich history that allows us to be proud to say that our heritage has contributed to creating the United States that it is today. So we hope that you enjoyed our video today, that it allows you a little bit of a better understanding of the area in which you live. Uh, hopefully it will help you to understand the fact that we have a very rich heritage in this part of Pennsylvania that has contributed to the heritage of our United States of America. It's something that we can all be proud of. So on behalf of Gene Scheip, Van Wagner, Larry Morden, and Herman Jones, I'm Mark Temple, and we hope that you enjoyed your educational video on iron industry in central Pennsylvania. Have a great afternoon.